Hello, my name is Alexey Katalevsky. So, let's talk about the thing that changed the genre of horror. The works and the world universe of the Howard Phillips Lovecraft. You just have to remember, put everything in order, so it's become clear. My friends have sent me a package from Russia. The only the one, one copy, copy they were, they were able, able to find. find. It's, it's smaller, smaller than I have free imagined. Image. But it's enough to get the things moving. Necronomicon. Familiar word, isn't it? You must have to heard it before, but didn't pay attention to it. Where does that word come from? Today I'm going to prove to you that you are already familiar with this universe, that you already heard of it and seen it. Today you are going to understand it, its importance to the world of literature, cinematography and probably the rest of the world. So, let's start from the beginning. Who was the Howard Phillips Lovecraft? The boy was born in a wealthy family, he loved books, literature, medicine and astrology, and hated seafood. It's not a joke, he really despised it. And probably thanks to that fact we see so many disgusting and repulsive images as many artists, he drew his inspiration from everything that surrounded him. From his own feelings, from things he saw in his life, from things he loved and hated. He was a big fan of Eastern mythology and even wanted to convert to Islam, but sadly he didn't manage to do it. However, he borrowed his maximum amount of information from all of its stories and created character by name is Matt Alhazre, who was the author of the Necronomicon, but we gone too far, let's go back. Howard Phillips Lovecraft stories were so deep and elaborated, so some people still believe that he didn't come up with the Necronomicon, but found it, read it and tell us about it. And maybe it's actually true? Let's find out what really the Necronomicon was. And without question whether it is, exists or not, it's a book of spells and frightful tales of what our world is really like, of the creatures that live in it, gods, monsters and other creatures beyond description. It is abound in human skin and its pages are written in blood. So did the Necronomicon really exist? Do you think I'm going to tell you? No, it's not that kind of show. If we will solve all the riddles, no, it won't be so interesting. Lovecraft felt uncomfortable in New York. I will have to, if I were moving from one small room to another. The houses, thirds were built slightly in those days. If he imagined all the monsters, why there were a chill presence near his house? Providence is a place where horror was born, or just a town in a Rhode Island, where Howard Phillips Lovecraft was born. Howard spent his early life in Providence. His father went mad due to unknown reason and was placed into the mental hospital where he died. 
Howard's grandfather becomes the breadwinner and was happy about it. That was a house where Lovecraft became acquainted with his grandfather's huge library. Sadly, the house has been demolished. His grandfather died when he was 14, and Govert and his mother lost the only source of financial support. They had to move from their mansion to cheaper apartment. 598 Angel Street. The house is still standing and anyone can visit it. Since then and until his death, the great writer could not stabilize his financial situation. He loved his city, and that's why all his stories take place in a new England. Ruid Island, Boston, Providence, and some other familiar cities nearby. Does the name Arkham mean anything to you? For some time Lovecraft lived in New York, because it's not far from Providence, and he had to move once in a while. But he didn't like the big city, so with Arthur he grew up in Providence and wrote most of his stories there, on Angel Street. In his first house Lovecraft had an enormous library. As a child he wandered between the shelves, took any book he liked, read everything, trying to learn more about that world and beyond. He also loved stars, he even wanted to become astronomer and dedicate most of his time to visit the huge observatory in Providence. We will see it later today. His family started having problems. Problems with money, the relatives dying or going mad. It's not very funny story. He stored all these horrors within himself and then put them on the paper. It's terrible things to say, but maybe it was a price for the art. Have you ever heard of such cool guy like Alan Moore? If not, let me give you a little hint. Do you know such works as a Watchmen or V for Vendetta or maybe Killing Joke? Yes, if you do, that you know who Alan Moore is. What if I told you that he is the author of the huge comic book named Providence? It's a wonderful book, full of references to Lovecraft universe. It doesn't refer to any particular work, but when you read it, you slowly start to recognize familiar details. Oh yes, it's R-rated. So you can see a lot of blood, brains and some um, naked parts of the human or monsters. Comic books. I oh, just funny pictures for people who can't read. That was my grandmother says. But defined pictures with name Providence refer to place that really exists. Same address, same house. What else did the comics get right? At the time, I had a little idea what this meant, but I was sure I had to go to Providence to figure it out. So, where is this wonderful Providence? About three hours from the central station in Manhattan, Rhode Island, about 60 bucks and you will be there. New England, mysterious infamous, rainy arc, horrifying damage. According to the book description there is, towns must be here. And the scorched land with the colors of the space and the hills where Yogg conceived his two offspring. In this book I saw description of the creatures similar to those I read about in Lovecraft books. But I still couldn't understand who came first. Lovecraft? Who invaded it Al Hazret, the author of the Necronomicon, or Howard Phillips, who merely borrowed his characters from the mad Ara. 
I needed proof stronger than the words on paper. And by then, I have already had something. Something I found years ago. That was a long walk along the Pacific Ocean beach. I asked the locals to try to find the traces of the ancient Aztec tribes. But I never thought that I would find something like this. Something much more ancient. Kunglui, Mglach, Ktulhu, Rliecht, Mnacht, Ktagen. His house, dead Cthulhu, waits dreaming. Let's talk about the most famous Lovecraft and monsters, Cthulhu. We already heard about him. Don't you pretend that you haven't. You know what he looks like. You see him on the t-shirts, in toys, in the games, in some movies. Giant monster who looks like a human, a dragon and a squid at the same time. He lives at the bottom of the Pacific and waits for his return. But till then he can only sleep and send dreams to the heads of impressionable people. And logically, you can read about him in one of the most famous Lovecraft works, Call of Cthulhu. Nowadays, Cthulhu is described in many different ways. Some of them are even really cute. But sadly, most people don't have a clue where he comes from. Some think that he is part of some mythology, other that he is an internet man, like Slenderman. But hold on, we already heard something about Necronomicon, Cthulhu and all this tentacle stuff. We've heard about it before, but couldn't remember when exactly. And what this familiar symbol? At first, I didn't believe that the book was authentic. I managed to de decipher a part of it and it led me to the familiar symbol. In many cultures, spirals symbolize life experience. Lives go on, spirals empty the eternity. But it also looked like wire wind, primal darkness, knows as a hustor. He also have an earth image to communicate with the humans. And it's called the King in Yellow. The symbols on the stone on Louisiana and the symbols near the Providence Cemetery. You don't realize how many references you miss when you watch movies, read books, see different stories. The perfect example is a true detective. You didn't know that the vision Matthew McConaughey character had was a hustle, the king in yellow. Did you? Sounds familiar. Yes. Guillermo del Toro is incredibly bright man. A man with uh, impossible imagination. He creates so many monsters, so many gears and the mechanism that works together and shows incredible stories. Scary tales and comics that came alive. For example, Hellboy. You can even imagine how many references to the Lovecraft works and hidden in the Guillermo del Toro stories. He always does what he thinks is right and creates things that are fucking amazing. And now we have a proof. At last, the shape of the water was recognized and got him an Oscar and the best 
movie in 2017. Back to the references, remember Hellboy? You just have to remember old Druk Jahat gods, who cruel thoughts reality trying to conquer the world. It must be in Azatot or Yogthatot or some other horrible gods invented by Lovecraft. Or you can recall the thing Rasputin carried inside him. Remember the classic of the childhood, the Evil Dead, or new edition Evil Dead Black Book. People treat them differently, but the idea is the same. Necronomicon, the book of dead able to summon something horrifying. There are no direct references to Lovecraft, but you understand what is it. What crosses your mind when you describe Cthulhu? A man with an octopus-like face and tentacles growing on it. You already know what I mean. Pirates of the Caribbean. Cthulhu served as an inspiration for the character David Jones. Third, he is much smaller than Cthulhu. Then, there were the references to Cthulhu even in the South Park. Not just references, there was a Cthulhu fighting together with a Cartman. And he becomes Cartman's best friend, like at his bed. In so many movies we have seen a giant library, with shelves stuffed with books, and certainly some of them are the works of Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Of course you can say that it's not true, but let's just look at the Aquaman. Even at the very beginning of the movie, we can see a huge references for the work Howard Phillips Lovecraft. You remember that moment when Aquaman mother meets Aquaman father. And just before the shot changed, we see a ball with a lighthouse in it. But what is it standing on? If you look closely, you can see several books and one of them is a Dunwich Horror. You probably think that it's Dunwich Horror, it's one of that works full of uh, fish creatures with the tentacles, fish men and stuff like that. But, surprisingly, no. There is a story about two brothers, one of them has more human in him and the other has less. They are trying to coexist to achieve a greater goal. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? You can find a lot of interesting things by the ocean. Unlikely sailors, dead fish, dried starfish. We are used to the fact that the ocean gives us what we just take. We forget how deep it is. And we still don't understand what's going on at the very bottom. We live by the ocean, walk, you know, swim, take a boat trip, trying not to think of the oppressive silence and the darkness under water calm. So much is hiding from human eyes. We are children dancing in the angle of the bottomless abyss. It is time to compare reality with fiction. The works of Lovecraft are full of addresses and description of the different areas. I should check them out. So I went looking. 7 Thomas Street. It was described in the novel Call of Cthulhu. The illustrations prove that the house has not changed themes. Let's go deeper. Why it's all so scary? Now I will take the place of the skeptical viewer for a while and start asking questions. Alexei, 
Horror is only frightening when you are immersed in the atmosphere of the horror. For example, take one of the best horror movies of all times, The Ring. We get scared because we see the tape too, and we are watching TV right now. And the first thing, uh, what we see as soon as the movie ends, it's a black screen from which the girl Samara can crawl out. Scary? How can the stories about the unseen gods of nowhere scare us as well as the things what we can feel in reality? Great example. And now, based on that example, I will try to explain to you what's happening. We begin with the fact that most of Lovecraft's story starts with the completely ordinary things. A person moves to unknown city, or goes to his friend's home, or just go to the work. Perhaps you can say that in a hundred years of perception of these books has completely deprecated. Because we all have a phone in our pocket, we can just google where we are and call Uber. Deprecation. Let's consider this based on of my favorite book Shadow Over Infamous. Inthmos is a city whose residents struck a terrible deal with the god Dagon. The children of Dagon and humans are born human, but over time they turned into the ugly monsters of the deep. They look like fish. Imagine that you are in their place right now, and it's getting dark. No phone connections, no bus is still morning. Nowhere to hide, because you are the only one human in the town. And your smell gives you away. Dark figures look at you behind every corner, with empty, billing fish eyes. And dead eagles wriggle under their hoods. You are horrified by the idea that it was a human face before. Just imagine what that mad cult can do with you. That people who sold their own children to the underwater monster. Part 2. The scale of the tragedy. How does it work? We began our story with the fact that we know the main characters. We understand his problems. It's a very personal story. But then it starts to grow. After most Lovecraft stories, you will experience several stages of accepting horror. The first, damn, it's frightening to live. The second, living is scary, but I am a very small part of this world, and nothing makes sense. And the third stage, my favorite, I am so small that all my problems are small too. So it. You have to enjoy life, because to all just does not matter. Enjoy what you have. An observatory is a keyhole through which you can look at the universe while the universe is looked back at you. And it does a green at you, curiosity, you know, and not ominously preparing plans for your destruction. Reality is worse. It doesn't even notice you. The main thing about imaging something, most of Lovecraft stories sounds like they really happened. Like a documentary. Take the Mountains of the Madness. The whole book looks like a logbook of the man who visited the South Pole. When you read this book, you catch yourself thinking, what if this is really a logbook that someone decides to publish? These works are unsightly realistic. Take the Blair Witch Project as an example. Why was this movie so scary when it came out? Because most people thought that it was actual student movie that was found and shown in the theaters. It was scary 15 or 20 years ago, and now it's a bit outdated. You may have noticed uh, how many directors used that first-person perspective in the movies, and now it's not cool at all. 
Lovecraft wrote his book 100 years ago, and they are still scary. And such a time test shows the quality of the works. So, when did I start doing this? Before Providence, before Louisiana, before Necronomicon, I can't remember. Oh yes, I was looking for some device for one of my customers. I've searched plenty of museums looking for it, until I was led to the KGB Espionage Museum in New York. I have no clue how it ended up there, but I was assured that the scientist who created died, and his colleagues trying to use the device for military purposes. Disguising it as some sort of pillingator. The employee of the museum will likely show how I should turn it on. Who would have thought that it still worked? I woke up in the hospital. No one couldn't explain to me that bites and burns covering my body. But I met a medical worker from the Providence Institute. He had an internship there. He was very interested in my medical history. He said that he works on a similar ones with his colleagues named Herbert West. The guy who had the dream to revive the dead. I don't know how it worked out, but I heard he was really persistent. And finally, the most important and the most obvious, the fear of unknown. We have heard that phrase that people are afraid of what they don't understand. Yeah, so that's how it works. You are sitting in a boat in the middle of the ocean. You look overboard and see a huge shape of the monster with a tentacle's claws and giant eye. You didn't even understand if you see the whole of it or not. How big is it? Where the end? of that shape, somewhere under water, in the darkness. How the violet bus so works? You sit in a boat, and you can see tentacles, you think maybe you have a giant monster under your boat, and then you realize, uh, no, actually, that's all what you have. Lovecraft plays with that concept brilliantly, because he invented a whole universe that works according to his laws and regulations. We are eager to look at this through the pages of the books, and we believe it works, because it's thought out entirely. I once found the logbook of the South Pole Explorer. Third, it was more of a diary. The mundane lives were interrupted by a sudden discovery. The people have found something. Uh, an imitator of species. Something ancient. Older than the history itself. Evil and ruthless. It was able to copy and the uh, living being. But no one ever found it in the proof. As usual.
So, let's talk about the problem. The main problem is the screen adaptations. Because today we understand that if there is a movie, then this must be popular and famous. Sadly, there are very few good screen adaptations of Lovecraft works. Uh, there can be many blockbuster movies based on Lovecraft works, because they do not work like blockbusters. I believe that the best adaptation will be the miniseries, like the recent Love, Death and Robots. Several different episodes, like short movies. I highly recommend you the series Love, Death and Robots, and especially episode 7, Beyond the Aqualia Rift. Uh, it is uh, not related to the Lovecraft works, but it has um, Lovecraftian spirit. I strongly recommend you it. I haven't cried during the movies for a long time, but the ending of that episode brought tears to my eyes. So, let's have a look to some movies that are close to Lovecraft stories. Let's start with a student film Call of Cthulhu which was made a uh, resemble of old movies. It's black and white, silent, and all that special effects were made by hands. Even the Pacific Ocean decoration, a puppet Cthulhu makeup, everything is just amazing. I highly recommend you watch it. It's very easy to find in uh, the in internet. 2005, Call of Cthulhu. Dagon, a film based on the story of the shadow over Innsmouth. It's not a copy of the original, but the idea is preserved. You may notice how the even Spanish B-movies can show us a good story. And you can imagine how good it will be if they had a blockbuster budget. At least, you should see this movie to say, oh, that's interesting idea, I want to read about it. Reanimator was as close to the original as possible. Jeffrey Combs plays an eccentric scientist who is observed with the idea of creating something beautiful. But instead, he creates a complete horror. Oh, how I can understand him. You can also see Jeffrey Combs in a From Beyond. This film also, uh, again, like a B-movie, but it's almost completely based on a Lovecraft story. Sometimes, even to go back to the time or non-digital visual effects, when everything was handcrafted by artists, the dolls, the mechanical monsters, animatronic dolls, it was pretty good. The creators really put heart into it. And now it's time to talk about the best film based on Lovecraft stories. When we talk about makeup or animatronic monsters, the first things that come to our mind is The Thing by John Carpenter. Perhaps it's not entirely correct to call this uh, movie of uh, 1982 an adaptation of Lovecraft, because it's a remake of movie The Thing, uh, 1951, adaptation of book Who Goes There by John Campbell. But even the movie's synopsis is very close to the book, Mountains of Madness. In fact, Carpenter he has uh, always been a big fan of Lovecraft, and his movie was inspired by his stories. It's the best mixture of horror, science fiction and psychological thriller. These three genres create a perfect one-of-the-kind symbiosis. But don't mistake it with a movie of 2011 prequel, that's movie shit. Then we have the movie The Resurrected. 1991, an undeservedly forgotten movie, no one knows about that, and it's the most accurate adaptation of the book The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. Again, not an adaptation of Lovecraft, but this is absolutely a film inspired by his stories, perhaps the best on my list. The Lighthouse, 2019, peerless visualization of madness, loneliness, searching for oneself among the waves of your mind. Great cast. Many awards and 10 minutes standing ovation after the premiere on the Cannes Festival. This is a great movie. I recommend it to everyone. Watch it in the cold weather with the Cannes fish and the white whiskey.
I could have to told you about some episodes of um, Operation TV shows, budget adaptation and other failed ideas, but I won't waste your time. Still, we continue to hope for the best. I hope you have watched The Magnificent Mandy with Nicolas Cage. Recently I learned that its creators will adapt their color out of space. Yes, yes, the thing I told you could never adapt for the big screen. But if someone managed to do it, it's theirs, guys. Because Mandy was a riot of the color and emotions. If you haven't seen it, you should. But how would their adaptation of Lovecraft looks like? I have no idea. But I believe in them and I hope for the best, because Mandy was f***ing awesome. I tried to find that wasteland, where nothing grows anymore. By the description it should be somewhere near Arkham City. A scary story about the meteor that fell from the bell, near a farm. The flowers that start to grow. The poor people and the animals who were melted by the color out of space. And the thing that broke free. So did I. Some people gladly let me into their houses. Some were closed and boarded up. I tried to grab any opportunity. Maybe because of this. Now I'm trying to piece together my mind. So when I got the opportunity to explore the Shannon house, just one night, I decided to sleep there as well. It was stupid of me, but also seemed stupid to believe in stories about the monsters, birds in the basement, or witches coming out of the certain corners, or rats with the human faces. I was tired, I wanted to sleep, and now I don't know if I am awake.
night seems to last as long as the week. But the sunlight reserved me that it was just a dream and everything was alright. Our mind protects us from insanity. Third, I clearly remember where I put my book. So, how bad is it? I got my first negative impression when I was taking photos of one of the, his houses in New York and met the owner of that house, who lived there for more than 50 years. I told him why I took photos of his house and he was very surprised. I drove to Providence, full of the inspiration and expectations, but I was disappointed. A small memorial tablet uh, was a Lovecraft square name hanging on the lamppost. Looking like some kind of street art, which can be removed just because it hangs too high. And the square is just an intersection. There are several bookshops on Angel Street, not so far from the house where Lovecraft was born and lived most of his life. I couldn't find any mention of him there. No memorial tablets or monuments. Maybe I just didn't notice his bronze boost of the author, along with his best works hiding behind the poster of another teenage anti-utopy bestseller where kids running into labyrinths uh, in the burning grasses. And there is no museum, no honorary bench with his signature, or even a flower bed on the side of house where Gower Phillips Lovecraft was born. In that place, there is a Starbucks. No, it is not a tragic movie. A small ray of the light shining bright in the pitch of darkness. And during my trip I understood that art would make its way. After my conversation with the owner of the house in New York where Lovecraft Apartments once was, I, I told him about it. The man was shocked by the history of his own house, because he also heard something about Cthulhu and the mysterious city Innsmouth. After meeting me, uh, the happy man rushed home to google the information and share it with his children and friends, as he had a new reason to be proud. In Providence, in a tiny shop dedicated to the author, I met a shopkeeper who told me how every year he and his friends together with Lovecraft fans seek to install the monument and the heart of the city. By the way, I have already seen this uh, unstyled monument, and I can say that it's very cool. Every two years in the Providence in, uh, there is a Necronomicon festival, uh, where people are trying to make the author more popular and expand the cult. On that cursed shunned house I met the owner, who was sipping coffee and checking his mail. It may surprise you, but I was blessed by his negative reaction. Upon hearing about the purpose of my visit, uh, he collected his things and went inside the house to let me take my pictures. Before leaving, he mumbling something like, oh god, again? <laughs> when it will end? Never, <laughs> I just uh, will bring you more visitors. And the most pleasant things happened when I was taking the picture on the house where Lovecraft lived after moving out of his home. The owner approached me and invited me in. But let the things that he showed me inside remain a secret. 
I walked through Providence, and the spirit of the city walked through me. Laughter bursts in the main library. The memorial tablet in the intersection with his favorite Angel Street. The house he was born, it's gone. And the another one when he was raised is still standing. Ordinary, conventional, unnoticed. Lovecraft store in the center of the city. For guests of the city and fans of the Lovecrafts. There is just the souvenirs remind you of fictional stories and legends. Safe. Harmless. So, let's draw some conclusions. Where should you start if you are really interested? In my option, the best way to start with the story Dagon. It's very short, but immediately surrounds you with the atmosphere of Lovecraft's world. It's breathtaking when you read about rotting fish lying in the scorching sun on a piece of the seabed, then he was rising from the deeps of the ocean. When you read about the main character who passed through all the tests and the things he meets during his journey, it won't leave you indifferent. Shadow over Innsmouth, Call of the Cthulhu, The Mountains of the Madness. I already told you so much about them, so I recommend you reading without knowledge most of information. Dunwich Horror. Honestly, I don't know how to tell you about it without uh, any spoilers. The events that took place in Dunwich are so strange, incredible and the primal that you won't be able to pass by small towns without feeling uneasy. Innsmouth. The shadow above is hiding the horrible rituals of the Dagon's cult. He was here a hundred years ago. There were the tales of the war actions in newspapers. And after that you couldn't find a trace of that cult. People summoned Dagon and slowly transformed into the deep ones slowly losing their human form every day. After that, they went into the ocean. If it's not true, then why that place looks like an altar leading to the ocean? Of course, the books I mentioned are my favorite. But the world of the Lovecraft is much deeper. All these works take place in the same universe, as a franchise with a bunch of the spin-offs. But there is some uh, that are not connected to the Necronomicon, Myth of the Cthulhu and others. But those short stories uh, don't get any worse because of it. So now I will tell you about some good short stories that are not connected to the mythology of the Lovecraft. The Outsider, From Beyond, Stone Man. Stone Man looks like a detective story, because we, trying to figure out everything, all that mystery, together with the main character, not even knowing how it will end. From Beyond, expand your mind. Damn, it's like literally equivalent of the LSD. The Outsider. If you don't know anything about it, and no one has spoiled of the ending for you, then maybe this story will make you a cry a little. The story took place among the mountains and hills. There were rocks everywhere, and it was freezing cold. But I went forward. Knowing that somewhere here among the trees may lie the human remains trapped in stone. 
if I would found them, it would be so proof. In the book, people turn to the stone slowly. Maybe I could can find bones or organs inside the statues. Finding the stone man would be great. But after 80 years, there is nothing left. If there even was something. We live in a times when any shit can be popular. We will think that nothing can be done about it. But to be honest, the solution is very simple. If you came to see a shitty movie, you must know that right now, in somewhere in another theater, uh, they show a good movie that just didn't have a budget for advertising. You will go and see a bad movie instead of the good one, and may say that uh, it doesn't change the situation, but next year you won't be able to choose between good and bad. In both theaters there will be show the bad sequel of the film you choose to see. Good, smart and talented things should become popular. I understand that it's very difficult, even impossible, but we can't give up. Howard Phillips Lovecraft is the man who changed the genre of horror. Unfortunately, he is not popular, and we have to fix it. Let's read the good books and watch a good movies, and then share your thoughts with your friends, tell your mother, tell your colleagues. Maybe next time, choosing a book, they will read a story by Lovecraft instead of some popular trash. Maybe before watching some stupid comedy, they will think and consider the shape of the water, pants, uh, labyrinth, or something that is not yet filmed. We may fix it together. If you feel what I feel, if you want to see what I want to see, if you think like I think, join me or just support me. All the funds I receive, new acquaintances I make, your artistic work and other help that I get served to create new interesting projects. Or they can help me to set off a new journey towards something big, mysterious and unknown. But if, like this time, only a few people will help me and resources will be limited, and I'll have no act as a lonely poor artist, so it's okay. We will continue to move forward. It's better to die unknown and poor than get money for something that ruins arts and culture. Maybe it's just my opinion. Or maybe not. Thank you very much. My name is Alexey Katalevsky. See you next time. Where am I? How many times have I been there? Am I awake? Or not? I can hear him. The great Cthulhu calls for me. He sends the vision to my dreams. So I must be asleep. Or it's all real.
I may have gone mad. The one thing I'm sure about it there is only one way to find out.